Edsel, where does this story begin? That's the hardest question I've ever been asked. <laughs> I, I think this really starts on October 10th, 1901, when Henry Ford won a car race with a vehicle called Sweepstakes. It set the path for Ford Motor Company. Ford was born on a racetrack. It really is how we began as a company and with my great-grandfather. And so ever since then, we've raced. The GT40 program was our first venture into European-style road racing against European cars. We wanted to go racing in Europe to beat the Europeans, uh, especially Ferrari. In the early 60s, Enzo Ferrari realized that he needed some corporate help if he wanted his company to continue to grow and if he wanted to compete you know, at the uppermost levels of motorsport. And at the same time, Ford Motor Company realized they, they wanted to change their image. They wanted to sort of appeal to the younger buyers, and they thought racing might be a good way to do that. So emissaries from each company sort of found the other, and um, they started negotiating. Ford sent Don Fry, who was very high up in the hierarchy, to negotiate directly with Enzo Ferrari. Things went well for a while, and then they didn't go so well, and Ferrari left Ford at the altar. Henry Ford II, who was then running the company, he was really peeved that he had essentially gotten the finger from Enzo Ferrari. And that's when he told Don Fry, you know, well, we can't join them, we'll go beat them. Back then, the pinnacle of road racing around the world was going to be Le Mans. Le Mans is a quiet little French community most of the year until the month of June when nearly half a million racing enthusiasts transform it into the motor racing capital of the world. That was about as ambitious as you can get as an American company, to go to Europe and race at Le Mans to beat Ferrari, who was dominant at that time, actually had just won so many years in a row. Ferrari of Italy has won the race seven times out of the last eight. No American car has ever won. My father wanted to beat Ferrari, and, and it didn't make any difference what it cost. He was really serious about winning the race. We had all the budget and all the facilities and materials that we needed. Anything we thought that we needed was right there. The first Ford GT was actually a modified Lola Coupe with the Ford racing body on it. It was an elegant, beautiful car. Problem is, at speed, the air would lift the front wheels. They got to Le Mans in 64. Phil Hill set the fastest lap of the race, but he said it's almost undrivable. I think the first car caught fire in the third hour or something. It was a huge bust. We didn't win that first year, but we learned a lot. They came back in 65, it was a little better. They showed up at Daytona and had some success. And then by 66, they were ready. Ford challenged last year with the GT40 Mark I. Now they are here with a faster Mark II. Henry Ford, his wife, and young son, Edsel, have arrived to see the investment pay off. In the first lap, the track was wet from a light rain. Still, the Americans' aggressive strategy is clear from the start. Take the lead early, set a fast and punishing pace, and outlast the competition. All afternoon, all night, all morning, the four GTs were still in the lead. And here they come for the finish. First place, the number two Ford GT. Second place, the number one Ford GT. Third place, the number five Ford GT. An authoritative win for the American challengers. The iconic one, two, three finish at Le Mans was, you know, perhaps of all the great moments, that was probably the defining moment in Ford's race history. My history at Le Mans uh, as a kid started when I was four months old, the first time I went. And then pretty much uninterrupted till I was about 18. I've had five top threes at Le Mans. Um, I've raced there 11 times, 
This is my 36th time to Le Mans. Um, so a lot of my life has been spent there and a lot of exposure to big teams. There's a genuine excitement that the Ford GT is in there. There are fans there that will have remembered the cars in 1966. The sad part about modern sports car racing is that no one really goes. You, you feel that you're doing it for TV, not for the crowd. Go to Le Mans, you feel like you're doing it for, for real people. For drivers that have never been there before, it must seem like a zoo. We're down here at the Drivers' Parade, this is tradition on the Friday of the month, and uh, we are here to uh, go around the town. Uh, you know, the fans have come out in their droves, you know, give me 100,000 people just over there, and uh, we drive around for sort of half an hour. We've got 8,000 wristbands and flags to throw out to them, and uh, it's just a chance for them to see the drivers up close before the big race tomorrow. Uh, it's a unique experience where you feel like a bit of a rock star because uh, you know, thousands of fans screaming your name and everything like that. It's an incredible experience. This is where I started driving when I was 15 years old and I know a lot of people around here. They saw me grow from the new kid in town trying to make it, you know, to kind of an accomplished race car driver, at least a professional who's making a living from his passion, which was all I could really hope for in the beginning. Le Mans is Le Mans. It's the, it's the Super Bowl of sports car racing. To come back on the 50th anniversary, of course, we would love to do it again. I think there's more competition this year, if I'm allowed to say that. Um, there's more manufacturers. Um, we have Aston, Ferrari, Porsche, um, Corvette, us, the three other Fords racing. So, you know, the competition has never, ever been stronger, particularly in this category. Whoever wins this year is going to really, really deserve it. I'm someone that loves the history of the sport. Ford won this race four times in a row between 66 and 69. To be coming back with the new Ford GT, with four, four incredible cars, is, is very exciting for everybody. I'm very excited to get on with it and get racing on Saturday, because that's what really matters. What I became a sports car driver for was to race here at Le Mans. And I can't imagine what it would be like to, to win this thing. So, you know what, I, I, uh, I'm not here really to give you a pep talk. You guys are all professionals. Um, you know why we're here. You know what we're here to do. But I think there is one thing that I will remind you of maybe. Um, all of you have probably raced in events that were more important to you, but there's one thing that I, that I guarantee you. You will never race again for as many people as we're racing for this weekend. Um, Ford's raced a lot. You know that. We've won in the Monaco Grand Prix. We've won Formula One championships. We've won Indy 500. 50 years ago, we raced here, uh, we swept the podium, and it meant a lot uh, because it meant we took on the world and we won. So I'm gonna be totally unfair and remind you that unfortunately there's only one chance to celebrate a 50th anniversary. The only thing they're asking of us this weekend is to uh, go like hell. So let's do that. I, I can't remember the time that I actually fell in love with motor racing. It's strange because there's no one in my family that is into cars and my, you know, it wasn't something my dad introduced me into from as long as I can remember, it's something that I've been in love with. This is really Raj's baby. He absolutely has been the driving force behind this and, and the one who had the vision for all of this to happen. And so all we're doing is executing on his vision. We've always been thinking about building another Ford GT the 50th anniversary of the win in 66 was coming up. And we felt we really have to do something to honor that win. Raj and Mark uh, came to me and said, we, we got something we think you're gonna like. In the car business, dates count and anniversaries count. We have the 50th anniversary of Le Mans coming up. Why don't we do another GT? When you talk for a GT, that's a higher calling within the company. That's an icon that lives on. 
50 years later, they're still talking about it. They're still talking about it in France. Well, I mean, one thing's for sure, you know, when we decided to do the GT, the birthday party was gonna happen, you know, the 50th anniversary one way or another, and uh, the time was ticking. We've got a lot to prove to not only the world, but uh, even to the people inside our company, and we intend to do that. The rules in GT racing are these are production-based race cars. And so you have to have a production car that you're building from, but we're still developing the production car. So we got agreement from all the other manufacturers to allow us to race as long as we delivered the production car in a customer's hands by the end of the year. Race car development, production car development almost started opposite ends. Race car, we start from the tire and we optimize everything to what does the tire want. Production car, we start from the driver and then we work everything downstream of the driver to make it feel right. It's a lot of engineering to do simultaneously, having to go through all the legal things you need to go through and the durability things you need to go through for a street car, and then be thinking ahead about what would be ideal on the track. People were identified within the company with areas of expertise, engines, suspension technology, aerodynamics, it launched this internal skunk works within Ford. It was a completely confidential project. It was a decision on the part of the team to build it not so much as a dedicated supercar, but almost as a laboratory for what is possible for the rest of the Ford line. To me, that was a very interesting approach. But there are difficulties, because if you do that, can you really be competitive? Or can we really take an EcoBoost engine uh, and make it a competitive race engine. It's a combination of direct injection, turbocharging, variable cam timing. So you can make a tremendous amount of power, but you can get really great fuel economy out of them too, which actually is an advantage, quite an advantage for a race engine. Who would have thought that we'd be putting a V6 engine in a supercar? So that's a bold statement when we said we are gonna do that carbon fiber, which has had tremendous application in racing already, to get the weight out, to get the strength up. The Ford GT is almost entirely carbon fiber. We're learning a lot from that, and we're working with our partners to figure out how to make it lower cost so that we can then expand the use of carbon fiber through the rest of the Ford lineup. We get to use racing to push the boundaries for everyday passenger cars that are in people's driveways. First M1 is, is moving, it's actually mobile. It, it's very restricted calibration rods, I think I've explained to you. It's only 3,000 RPM. Shifts are gonna be really delayed. I mean, it's, it's gonna be rough. It's kinda... treating 3,000 as a red line? It is. You're coming in with an all new car and, and an all new team. We're still learning the car, we're still developing the car, and things will happen that we didn't anticipate. Whether it's tactics, whether it's endurance, whether it's technical issues, whether it's do you have enough outright speed, you don't know any of that until you get out on the track. It's the most fun I've had doing 20 miles an hour. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't start sandwiches. eating without us? All the pizza's gone. What do you mean the pizza's gone? There's pizza and subs. We don't have cooling problems with these engines. Um, in fact, we kind of have the opposite. We have trouble keeping temperature in them when, when it's cold outside. Upon teardown, we did not see any other signs of distress. The engine looked actually really good for 20 hours, and we would say with pretty good confidence that that engine would pass the durability test. So we've got a race-proven engine in 16. Yes, we do. And Larry's already started bolting it in. We're working with Larry Holt, mastermind from Multimatic. And Multimatic brings to it expertise that, that we don't have at Ford. They're great racers, and they know how to put race cars together probably better than anybody. Uh, when it comes to the road car and, and, and a ground-up road car, I think, uh, I think that there's been a bit of a learning curve there on exactly what it takes. But again, we're partners in this. Starting to look at um, a lot of work on the front underwing, where we found we're hugely powerful, but very sensitive. We're trying to move 
move the center pressure on the underwing uh, so it's not so pitch sensitive. Uh, we like it a lot, but it does impinge on the front of your car, guys. But we'll work with you on shape and we just need a gaping hole in the front of the car if it's okay more. <laughs> you know, Ford Motor Company can be a little bit conservative and then you have this mad scientist to really push, you know, what if we did that? What if we did this? And, and so you have this meld of crazy ideas and sanity coming together in a really great balance. 17th of September, we have to be there with everybody else with a representative engine, basically so that they can set our BOP. <laughs> Seemed like we had so much time last year. Ford went to Le Mans for the first time in 1964. It took until their third year, 66, before they actually won it. You know, I want to go on record here that, that you know, history says it took three years. We're going this year, first year in the 50th anniversary with a very high expectation. I'm very confident that we have the tools to do it, but you'd be an absolutely arrogant idiot to sit here and say you're gonna win Le Mans because it's a, it's a, uh, that's a tough race and it, it can, be very, uh, can be very nasty. So when I first heard about this race program, my first reaction was, I mean, I'm 48 and I was like, so, I, I mean, I'm, you want Le Mans winners, I'm a Le Mans winner, I, I have to drive. Uh, I'm still fit, I'm still fast. I and mean, literally, I went into that mode because uh, how could I not? And then everyone talked me out of it. Uh, in, uh, but it was, it, was, it, it was such a dynamic program that you, and the thought of it was so exciting that uh, who wouldn't want to be a part of it? You know, fortunately, we had a lot of interest in, in race car drivers and wanting to drive this car. Um, and so a lot of applications came in jointly between ourselves and Chip Ganassi. We went through that process and really got the cream of the crop. How did this whole racing thing start for you? <laughs> That's a great question. I, um, when I was, uh, <clears throat> when I was probably f three years old or four years old, my father was in the asphalt paving business and he, he paved a go-kart track and uh, the guy didn't pay him for some reason. So we ended up with uh, three go-karts. We only weigh about 80 pounds, five horsepower is a lot. That's how my motorsports career got started. You know, Chip's an interesting guy. He was a racer himself, driver. He raced Indy cars. He is the second most successful racing team in the U.S. after Roger Penske. Chip Ganassi hires the crew, he hires the personnel, the management, everyone to oversee that the program works. It's so much about the man and the machine and having to optimize both of those to be successful. You can throw a lot of technology at race cars, but at the end of the day, it's all about the gentleman or the woman who sits behind the wheel and drives the car. Edsel wanted to have a meeting. He said, we'd like to work with your team. I said, sure, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm all ears. And they took us down in the bowels of a building somewhere. We walked down a hall and down another hall. And where the hell are they taking us? And sure enough, you know, we come around the corner and there's people beavering away on a car over the corner. And you go, what the hell is that? And uh, that was it. The way they concealed it was genius. I mean, it was, there was no way anyone was going to know what was down there. And the only people that went in there were uh, literally a handful. There were the designers, and then the top people in the company that were involved in the project. No one knew about it. If you can use innovation to build the ultimate Ford performance vehicle, what would it be? Well, here's an idea. When it came out, the impact was spectacular. In this day and age where you see spy photos of everything all the time, it was an amazing accomplishment just to get it out as a surprise. And then the car itself was fantastic. You know, looking at all the details, the way the wastegate exits through the taillight, uh, you know, the fact there's actually plumbing in the buttresses, all the stuff, it is you know, the absolute pinnacle of what can be done. Well, I don't think the GT is successful at all yet. I don't think we know. 
I think it's been well received by the media. I think it's been re well received by the enthusiasts based on the number of emails I get um, on how do I sign up to buy one. Um, but, you know, it, we haven't really launched the car. It's been, in, the race car has been in testing. So we really don't know whether it's successful yet. I was thrilled as a, strictly as a fan, to see Ford, to hear that Ford intended to A, build, you know, a new version of the GT and B, go racing. That said, I, I gotta confess that the idea of winning Le Mans your first time out in a brand new car uh, is a real big challenge. I wish them the best, but I think I think I would have been uh, more confident if this were year two of the program rather than year one. You know, the first time you get in a prototype, it's a nervous moment. You can kind of tell have you got the basics right? Is this something you're going to be able to work with, or is this, this is going to be a long haul? This is everything we've been working towards here together, Multimatic and Ford. There's going to be a couple of milestones. One will be taking the checkered flag at Le Mans 2016, but another important one is the first day we ever run the racing car. That's an important day for any new production car or race car, that first shakedown. It's your first chance to figure out the character of the car. If it's not good out of the box, it's going to be tough to make it good and really tough to make it great. exciting to get the car actually on the track, right? So expectations were not high. It was mainly just to see the car move. What we're seeing today, though, is we're seeing a car that's almost ready to race. It's been running good, but more importantly, it feels right. It's doing what the simulation said it would do. Usually for a shakedown, we're working out structural issues that are wrong, that you know the car doesn't have the right balance, or we need to go back and rethink. And we're already beyond that step and talking about tuning the car, you know, things that usually happen weeks or maybe even months later. So it's been a very good start. We don't want to be overconfident. We're almost kind of worried about how good it's going. working through our test program really quickly and into development of the vehicle right away. Those first initial tests, we just wanted to make sure we're handing off a car that's ready to be race developed and, and providing that to, to Chip Ganassi and Chip providing uh, you know the crew and the race car drivers and the operational side of that. I think for an engineering team, it's it's been great, the, the development capability of all of our drivers and, and telling us what they need out of the car. Four cars, three drivers per car, that means you need to find 12 great drivers. It's a very considered decision selecting the drivers. Primarily you're looking for, for speed and consistency, and then after that you start to get into character and whether or not the guy's a team player. Chip has this amazing knack to be able to look you right in the eye and know if you're right for us. There are lots of drivers out there that are fast. In endurance racing, where you share the car, you need to compromise. There's always a little give and take with other drivers. That's ultimately what made the decision for us. It's a little bit unheard of, really, to staff up in such a way, because almost every other race program starts with one car and then goes to two or whatever. And so to staff up for four cars on two continents for full schedules is, you know, there's not really a precedent. You have 12 of the top drivers in the world who are all, by virtue of their success, by what made them successful, very self-centered, egotistical, ambitious, dog-eat-dog, -dog, mano a mano guys. Westbrook is one of the most intensely competitive drivers you know I've ever met. 
he's such a gentleman, but you see him get pissed off when something happens. It makes for a great interview in the pits because, you know, there's no holds barred. Joey Hand, he's a fighter. You know, he's a, he's like an MMA fighter in my opinion. You know, he's right there. It's exciting for Marino. His brother had outstanding success. So the first thing is people go, he got the drive because of his brother. You don't do that in a program at this level, but this is his biggest chance in his career, and he knows it. Dirk Mueller, one of Nürburgring's top drivers, has a huge amount of GT manufacturer experience. There's nothing they can throw him on the radio or on the track that he won't have seen before. I love the fact they brought this group together. Ford's history at Le Mans is one of their greatest stories in motorsports of all time, and to be at the return is beyond words. It's not too often programs come around like this. I haven't even been to Le Mans, so it's, uh, you know, for me, it's, there's going to be a lot of eyes wide open, um, mouth probably a little bit too occasionally, just, uh, you know, taking it all in. You know, the history of Le Mans, the first thing you think about is the 40 keys. Suddenly you're being part of that, it's like, like a dream come true. For me, that's the first thing that came to mind. I, I want to be part of that history. There's nobody there that wouldn't send that thing right into the fence trying to win that race. Those are all top-notch, front-running badasses in those cars right now. You could almost overdo it. To be handed the mantle to make this program be successful and win, that's a big deal. So Ganassi's assembled the kind of driving talent that, you know, there are no excuses. They've been assembled for a reason. They're professionals and they're there to win. Prior to Le Mans, we'll have six races starting at Daytona. So all of those are going to be real races, but they're also, to some extent, going to be practice for Le Mans. And certainly our plan is to get better every single race and leading up to make sure we're ready as we can be for Le Mans. I mean, look, we're having an all-new car. Um, we're having all-new drivers who have no familiarity with those vehicles. So it's a tall order. It's a very tall order. Having said that, I expect us to win. Welcome everyone to Daytona, I'm Brian Till. Thrilled to be a part of another Rolex 24, and that Ford GT has everyone talking. The guy that's been dreaming about this for months is uh, Executive VP and Chief Technical Officer of Ford, Raj Nair. Now, uh, the battle back then was with Ferrari. The Crosstown guys are Corvette. We all dream about storybook finishes. Who would you like to be banging doors with and no head out by a nose, Corvette or Ferrari in 24 hours? Well, you know, we're, we're pretty focused on the win, so hopefully we don't focus too much time on what the order is behind us. So we're just going to focus on the front. Nervous, <laughs> really, yeah, nervous, stressed, stressed out a bit. You know, everything that we need to do technically, we've done. I'm very confident in that aspect. But 24-hour endurance racing is, you know, there's a bit of statistical luck associated with it. I'm not going to tell you we're not here to win. I mean, it, you go racing to win. We all go racing to win. But this really is all about going to Le Mans. This is it for my career. I don't know what I'm going to do after this. <laughs> Buy a, vi a, win a winery summer? I don't know. It's, this is it. This is it. Going to Le Mans this year, that's it. They roll into the throttle. We are green at Daytona, the Rolex 24. Speaking of machines, there's the 66 of Joey Hamm. He is now up into second and is running down the 911. It's handy. This is first and second at GTLM. Outside. He pulled the draft early and popped out. Runs alongside. He's going to cross the stripe in the lead. Can he hold it down into turn one? Ford leads on their debut. Ford versus Chevrolet here on the high banks. This is going to be an interesting one here. Take a look at that Ford. Oh, oh delay that there. That was close. Something There's a happened. problem, yeah. Certainly lost some drive there off of that turn for Ryan Briscoe. The guy that's stuck in six here. Yeah, 10-4, fifth this lap. So what it's doing is it's just flickering between fifth and sixth gear right now. Then something internal and we'll go back to the garage.
had a bit of diagnosis, found that it was one of the pneumatic valves that controls the shifting in the gearbox. Not something we've seen today in testing. It's a shame it had to happen in a race. Another problem for one of the four GTs. It is the 66. This is not good. So Joey's going to pull it off the racing surface down to the inside. He's lost drive completely. He's going to have to rely on safety workers to get him back into the garage area. I hate losing. I, I don't like it. To be honest, we expected the reliability to be better. Some of the things that broke today are either not even new for the car. They're parts that a lot of the rest of the field are running as well, but for some reason they broke on our car. Some of the things we wouldn't see in normal testing, you just have to race to see it. Um, that doesn't change the, the frustration of, of having that many issues. This car, since it's been back out and running, Cal, has been running very, very quickly. It really has. I think Ryan Briscoe may have set the fastest lap of the race in the GTLM category, so it's shown pace, and his 24-hour race will now become a test session for them. They're looking at the big picture of the championship. I know they wanted success their first time out, but uh, there's a lot of other milestones they're going to try and reach this year as well. You know, we've got a good amount of time to go back and take a look at what went right and what went wrong, and I think we'll, we'll come back ready to go for Sebring, and we'll be even stronger than we are right now. You can't have it both ways. You can't have something really, really, really matter and have it be totally controlled. I mean, just that's just the nature of it. But that's what makes this sport. I mean, the highs are so high, but they're also not frequent, you know? And so, you know, the best guys win 10% of the races, you know? And so to have everything line up on the day, at, on the year, just doesn't happen very often. We showed up at Daytona with higher hopes and uh, obviously left with our, our tail between our legs a little bit. I think uh, we were caught out by some, uh, by some issues that, that I would characterize as uh, when you're trying to do things in six months that other people have been working on for six years, you, you, you say, oh yeah, I forgot about that. The general conversation after Daytona was, you know, is, are they embarrassed? They tell you the program is good. They tell you the car is strong. They tell you that they're going to win a race at some point. And then to not be able to make it to the first two hours of the race because of a gearbox issue, you know, you're immediately like, oh, are they embarrassed? Were they lying? Have they had these issues? And, and so it raises some question marks for sure. Welcome to the pit lane at the one and only Sebring 12 Hours. This is spring break for racers, and over 80,000 people have been here partying this weekend. But right now, it's time for those racers to rock. With more on the action at the front of the grid is Jamie Howe. Well, the energy here at Sebring, Justin, has been felt all week long. The nerves and the angst from not just the drivers, but also the crews has been evident. Coming off of Daytona, we had some issues. We know we have them fixed. But this is Sebring. This is a whole new animal. So I don't expect to see the issues that we fixed, but it won't surprise me if we see some new issues. Um, looks like we're gonna get some rain today, and that's a good thing. We go out and uh, put the car through its paces in the rain. So uh, today's gonna be interesting. This is the kind of track, it, you know, it's, we always say it's, it's half the size and twice as hard. So we'll see what happens. Now on board the 66 from Ford, running third right now, Dirk Mueller. And, you know, a lot of people were surprised to see some of the problems that they had at the Rolex 24. I don't think we were. Brand new car, first race is what they really want. The prize that they want is Le Mans coming up in June. Crashes, who do you blame? The pilot. That's the position that you choose to put yourself in when you want to become a professional race car driver. But sometimes it's not necessarily always fair. You don't want to be that guy that writes that thing off. <laughs> you know, you just don't want to be that guy. Normally, if you have a lot of wheels, normally you should be able to still turn because the right side wasn't locked. Yeah, the right side didn't show up. Uh, no, it was the left side. It's only left. Side. 
I tried, I tried, I tried, but there was so much water. I was basically just boating, and um, yeah, it was unfortunate. But the team came to me and said there was nothing you can do, which you know brings me up again because uh, you feel you let your your boys down. Well, they need always someone to go off to make the excuse. And this time it was you. Thank you. Dirk just got caught out and locked up in a turn one. There was really nothing he could do to the car hydroplane. Um, all the telemetry said the brake pressure and everything was good, but the car just hydroplaned and went into the tire wall. And um, unfortunately, right after that is when they red flagged it for the condition. So uh, we just missed that by a little bit. And now the, the car's back here in the garage, um, but during a red flag, you can't repair the vehicle. It looks like there's going to be a red flag for, for a while. spend most of my time on the NASCAR side of things and then I fly in on race day and race weekend and help these guys. I help on the front end of these cars. We want to perform well and we want to, you know, make some history and, you know, back up the program for Ford and for ourselves as fans. I think all of us are trying to think more long term towards Le Mans and trying to make big gains on our reliability and try to make the best of it. I'm, ha I'm happy. I mean, I'm not like thrilled jumping up and down happy, but I mean, all the issues we had at Daytona, we didn't have any reoccurrence of those issues. So from that perspective, we're, I think we're good. Through these first few races, maybe we get our bad luck out of the way. You have seen that 66 car that's been through the wars a little bit here today. Problems it looked like for both of these four GTs. I think we've been building momentum since Daytona. We've been working on getting everything synced together, you know, getting the whole team, getting the car ready to be durable and run. We want to show up at the track, not have a lot of the extracurricular activity, and just go race. With every race, we continue to improve and get better and get faster and get more reliable. And coming into Laguna, I think everybody felt positive and cautiously optimistic about the weekend. Now see the second of the four GTs, Richard Westbrook down to the inside, <laughs> into the hairpin, what a move. What a story this is, as they head into the month of June in Le Mans. And he heads into the final turn, and here it is, the first win, the four GT at Monterey. Today, Cal, they came together. From Daytona to Laguna Seca, you saw a program gel. You saw them have problems. Um, mechanically, you saw them have problems personally, um, and then you saw them all come together and, and make it work. Not only was it the first, obviously, win for the GT, but it was the biggest morale boost I think that you could have had in a team that has been working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you know, giving everything they got, and what a validation of what's been going on. Two Fords getting ready for the big one. This is more like the cars we were expecting to see from Ford at the beginning of the season. These are the Fords we've been looking for. Everyone's ready, but then the actual race happens and things and you just can't predict. It's racing, and everyone knows in racing, things go wrong. <laughs> The best racer in the world loses more races than he wins. You have to have a mentality of, if you lose, you don't dwell on losing, you dwell on why did you lose and how are you going to fix that for the next race. Sitting here three days before the start of the race, I guess the biggest thing is, where do we really stand with the pace of the car and the endurance of the car? You know, I think that's everybody's question. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on. I don't really like the week. I like the race. You're just building up, building up, and you want to get out on the track. But Wednesday's a good day. It's the start of first practice, start of first qualifying. want to have the fastest
fastest lap at the end of the qualifying sessions so that you can start on pole for the 24 hours of Le Mans. Ford kind of came in and surprised everybody. They weren't spectacular in the test days in the week leading up to the race, but they were spectacular in, in qualifying. Ford had their four cars in the top five positions. Being one, two, four, and five is a, is a good start. It was the first time we had run the car in full out qualifying trim here. And um, I think it's fair to say for all of us, the car responded even better than we expected, which is why I think there's, there's a good mood here. But we've got a lot of work to do, so it'll be important to stay focused. People are excited about where we qualified, and, and that's a good thing, and it's exciting, and it shows the potential of the car. In reality, in an endurance race, qualifying is not very important. By Sunday afternoon, people will forget where everyone qualified. They have a, a lofty expectation. The perfect story is that they win this particular weekend in June. No one will blame them for not winning because it's, it's too hard a feat to go to Le Mans in the first year. Uh, they'll lead the race for sure. Um, they'll lead the race for a lot of it, I think. Uh, their drivers are equally as fast as anybody and the car is super quick. But the demands of the long run through and, and not getting involved in accidents and what is the weather going to be like uh, is, is tough. When I came on in the first year of Corvette, our three-year program was literally just to be able to go there. That first year, our car finished third and Ron's car finished fourth, and the team was ecstatic. Never did anybody ever have a delusional thought that we're going there to win the race. It's much harder than anybody thinks. And, uh, you know, sometimes you can have all the, you know, all the components that you think are right in line, but they've got to gel, they've got to blend, and, uh, you know, best of luck to them, for sure. But it is no easy feat to go in there the first time after 50 years and try to win that race. Ford's data bank of going to Le Mans is not, is not rich. Same for Ganassi. Ganassi have no institutional knowledge of going to Le Mans. I mean, everyone else is trying to win. Corvette are probably the highest technology race team outside McLaren. Pratt & Miller do the guidance systems for, for tracking missiles in space, so they can make a race car go around the track. They've won there eight or 10 times out of the last 15 years. Porsche, man, they've got that place figured out. They are the outright all-time winning brand, and it is to this day what creates that aura that makes Porsche what it is. Ford, it's an unknown entity. There's gonna be things that need to be figured out. Uh, you know, the tough thing here at Le Mans is because the track's you know, about eight and a half miles long, so you could have rain on one end and dry on the other, and that's when it becomes very tricky because you have to stay on slick tires, you can't use reins because you'll burn up the reins on the dry part, so you have to just work your way through the wet part. So dry in the second chicane, guys, so dry. From a driver's standpoint, we just really would like to have one or the other, you know, it's, it becomes really tricky when it goes back and forth. But it is what it is. Le Mans is a very treacherous place. There was times where there's river crossings and you go over it three times and you wouldn't aquaplane and you'd hit it the same angle the next time at 180 miles an hour and the whole car go like that. And then you go, oh, you gotta breathe. So we're going to have to gauge this engine. Obviously, we've got all the options ready. You uh, you did drive in all the conditions, so uh, you're sort of the best to judge and give us as much feedback as you can. 
Jimmy, at the moment, we would take the drying wet, without a doubt. Yeah, Andy, with the weather the way it is, you can afford to speed up a bit. You're OK to give it some more RPM. I'll be my RPM. I'm stuck in third gear, mate. No upshift at the moment. No upshift at the moment. Uh, Andy, just go to manual. Go to manual mode a minute. Manual mode, I have upshift. Manual mode, I have upshift. Okay, try downshift to see if it uh, frees it. Downshift. No downshift, no downshift. Keep requesting up and down. Keep requesting up and down. Does it shift continuously with the clutching? At the moment, no. It's sticking, mate. I'm in the last corner onto the grid. It's stuck in fourth gear. You're going to have to push me. I can't. I'm not going to burn the clutch out here. OK, Andy, we're coming to you. See what we can do. The number 67 Ford GT, one of four identical cars in this race, being back into its garage. Andrew Marriott, can you update? Yeah, well, they've definitely got an engine problem with this. They fired it up a couple of times. The rear deck is off, so that's what they're working on at the moment. I'm pretty sure that this car won't take the start. Driver sitting at the wheels, about 15 people all clustered around it. George Howard Chapel, the team manager, is uh, directing operations here. But there's definitely something wrong with the motor. So, just so everybody understands, it's worth a 10-minute go of fixing it like this, because otherwise, basically, we're into a really big stop. So it won't matter much, will it? Hey, I wonder what the procedure is now when everyone else is gone. It's pit lane. Just wait for the green line. Here we go. Have they set off yet? No, no, no. Well, Harry, this is a crushing disappointment. I thought it was a motor problem. It seems to be the gearbox. Yeah, gearbox issue. We lost uh, gearbox pressure um, on the reconnaissance lap, so uh, brought it to the box. And uh, always think they found maybe a quick fix, so we're going to see if that works. Um, if not, I think we're going to be in for slightly longer, but we're going to try this now and see how it goes. You had one of the Fords starting from the garage. The cars are so close, they're they're built exactly the same. So immediately off the bat, you're like, okay, so are four cars gonna make the end of this race or are any cars gonna make the end of the race? It was for 24 hours, you're questioning the survival of the program. Yeah, for that to happen even before the race starts, um, you know, on the one hand, you're thinking, oh boy, this is gonna be a long 24 hours. On the other hand, uh, I was thinking, well, I'm glad I brought four cars. <laughs> Back live at Le Mans. On a rainy French day, but the sun is poking through. The crowd in the grandstand are folding their umbrellas and taking off their rain slickers. That's a good sign. This is the first time in the 84 runnings of this race that the 24 hours of Le Mans has started behind the safety car. Safety cars are in, green lights all around the track. No overtaking before you cross the line. Safety cars in, green lights all around the track. The class structure in sports car racing is unique. You have essentially four different races going on on the racetrack at the same time. So you have the prototypes. Those are things that manufacturers are developing to be on their cars maybe five, ten years down the road. From a coverage standpoint, you always follow the overall leader. So that's always in sports car racing going to be a prototype. But recently, um, the GT categories have, have gained a lot more interest because they are cars that people can relate to. GTE Pro cars look like cars that you would see driving down the street. The competition level there is so intense. What a battle here in GTE Pro between the Ferraris and the Fours, just like we saw 50 years ago. What a battle it is as one of the Ferraris jumps in front of the Ford GTs. Everywhere you go, someone reminds you about the history of Ford in Le Mans. So you're permanently reminded of it, and you can't really escape it. Not that I want to. For 
me, I think it's, there's definitely some nerves. You understand the big picture, you understand the emphasis on the 50 year, you know, there's obviously a big story behind it. Um, but to expect to come here and win the first year is, is, is a very large expectation. We try to think of everything as a team. You know, you try to think of every different scenario, but a lot of us haven't been here. We haven't raced here before. There, there's so many things that can take you out of it, but I think with having four cars, um, you know, definitely, you know, spreads that stress and, and emotion a little bit. No matter what happens, we're gonna be part of history. You know, I'm, I'm gonna be one of those guys that 50 years later made an attempt at this. Hopefully we can say that we won it or podiumed or whatever, but at least made an attempt at it. This is not where you want to be at the end of the Molson into Molson Corner. And for Marino Franchitti, that's not where he wants to be right now. And he said on the radio, I just locked him up. I couldn't get it unlocked. He is not the first car that we have seen in there. In fact, it's a very popular place to be today, but it's an easy mistake to make at the end of the straightaway. The good news for Ford is this is the car that had the problem early on and was already several laps down, and they did bring four of them, so. Right now, the 67 car is really out of contention. The 68 car is doing really well. It's trading first place back and forth with Ferrari right now, so. We'll see what the night brings. Joey, let's get this lap. Bit, bit. We'll do a driver change. Disconnect your cooling tube. Disconnect your drink tube. Okay, man. That's good news because we don't have a lot left here. Good time to make some driver changes. Go ahead, put those guys in, let them run into the twilight, and then when you put your next driver in, in a couple of stints from now, a few stints from now, they can get in in total darkness and they'll already be acclimated to it. We saw the 68, Joey Hand pitted from the lead. Sebastian Bourdais has taken over that car. Billy Johnson aboard the 66 now. And you brought up the point too, Brian, of having the same driver in, in this transitional period from daylight to, to darkness. That's the effect that the sun has on your eyes, the different places that you that it bothers you around the racetrack and having someone in there as it's transitioning and not just in there right away. Beginning of the race, it was a little bit stressful because number 67, you know, had some gearbox problems, but got back in and they're all racing now. And I can't wait till the sun goes down because that's when it becomes really, really special. Beautiful overhead view as the night falls and the party begins in earnest. Racing at Le Mans, especially at night, is very out-of-body experience. Not that it's so pleasant, but you're doing it, and the visual input you're getting as a human is very out of this world. The guys do get into a, let's not call it, you know, trance state. That sounds crazy, but guys get in the zone, and, and at night especially. And, and uh, you get in a rhythm of driving that track and where on occasion, you know, you talk to your driver on the radio and, and uh, they'll, they'll not answer you. 
it's like you're almost in a dream because everything is so weird. The lights, the weather, the racing itself. Um, you know, you have to really trust your knowledge of the course because you're going into corners 170, 180 miles an hour. Um, and, you know, if you get it wrong, you know, you're gonna get really hurt. I mean, it is dangerous, it is dangerous. I mean, you can't get away from that. It's, it's that sort of tunnel feeling when you go through Tete Rouge, down the long straight, and then sometimes it can get a bit lonely out there. It's weird, it's, you know, sometimes in the night you don't see any other cars and you, you might do a radio check just to check, you know, your team is still there. We put repeaters out all around the track. Radio repeaters, our telemetry, can't deal with the size of that track. So if, you, if you're just trying to take everything in and out from the pits, the Malzang, Malzang Corner is too far away. So you got all these repeaters out there and you do everything you can to keep in radio contact with the driver. Back at Le Mans, lighter still and the skies overhead. Partly cloudy skies, it looks like hopefully we are free of rain in the run to the finish. Now a little over nine hours away. Overnight, Ford and Ferrari went back and forth. And then when the sun came up for the second day, Ferrari was leading and Ford found themselves in second. I'm still on a between the first and the second Picked up a lot of Yeah, 10-4. Uh, that's what we figured. We may change our plan here a little bit. That Ferrari really came to life yeah, as we got the darkness last night. Hasn't let up since. Seems to me just reading into the pattern of the last six, eight hours, Tommy, that the Ford seems to be a bit susceptible to the cooler conditions. And Running behind the pace car, hasn't got a lot of tire temp in there. The track conditions aren't that high either right now, so seems like the car is not quite coming to life as quickly as the Ferrari has been all night. Which is kind of keeps with our thesis that it, it maybe is between compounds and would like a softer one right now in these conditions. Now, if things get warmer, does that put them right in their sweet spot and start to take the Ferrari out of theirs is, is maybe the question. If you base on yesterday afternoon, you'd say so. Lamar born and bred Sebastian Bourdais trying to run down Tony Vilander in the class leading Ferrari. He doesn't like being second. He's finished second three times overall running for Peugeot. And the Frenchman, his hometown is Lamar, wants that one position ahead of the Ferrari. For me, it's really tough because I've been dominating this place so many times and came short within the last few hours or, you know, something's gone wrong in the morning or whatever. And, and it's just one of those where you're kind of dreading almost the moment where it's just going to go haywire. And, you know, you kind of almost start to feel that there might be a curse or something. The last time I was in the car around from 6 to 9 a.m. or something like that, and the computer went bananas, and now I had like no, no, no information. Um, pit, speed limiter wasn't working anymore, so I had to come through the pits, you know, at a guesstimated speed because the display wasn't displaying anything anymore, and I couldn't stop the car. And uh, this is happening again. We were having trouble with electronics in the car. Um, and so much of it goes through our steering wheel, including when we come into the pits, the driver shut the engine off through the steering wheel, and only then are we allowed to refuel the car. So the rule says engine must be off while we're refueling. And when he came in, um, the engine didn't shut off. Huge! 
huge. That's Dirk Mueller. That's the second place GTE Pro entry, and they'll have to come to pit lane. And right now, the gap, only 12 and a half seconds in GTE Pro, but this is huge for Ford. Having to serve a penalty at Le Mans means that you have to exit the racetrack, your, your race speed, drop to pit lane speed, drive all the way down pit lane, and then get yourself back up to speed again in a safe manner. It can cost you at least 30 seconds. We have a drive through penalty for our pit stop. The engine was running when we were fueling. I need you to drive straight through the pits here. Sorry, buddy. That's what separates racing from every other sport. If you can hit the worst shot in the history of golf and still win the Masters on one of your shots, you can throw an absolutely atrocious pass and win the Super Bowl. If you have a bad corner at Le Mans, you're not winning. We talk about mistakes that can take you out of this event. Did Ford just make a mistake on pit lane? We'll have to see how that pans out. You've got plenty of time left. You, you've had a problem, over six hours to go, and you come in, you take your medicine, and now you focus forward on getting the job done again, and you make up that distance. You can't let that affect you mentally. The car's very easy on its tires, which we designed it that way, but it also means it doesn't always get heat in the tires, particularly on a cold night. And as it warmed up, we knew the car was going to get faster. And so we knew we still had a, a good chance of catching him, um, but it was going to require us to really run flat out from that point. Dirk got that message, and, and he just ran lap after lap after lap and cut into that lead. And I think, you know, by the time he handed the car over, he had cut almost a minute down to only 15 seconds or so. Okay, hey, Dirk, pit this lap, pit, pit. Disconnect your helmet, too. Disconnect your drink, too. Driver change. <laughs> so, Joey, they let Malicelli in. You're seven seconds back. I'll keep you posted, buddy. Good clean laps here. Joey Hand now behind the wheel of the 68 as he hunts down Matteo Malicelli. You ride on board with Joey right now, and the car that you see in front is the bright red number 82. This is for the lead in GTE Pro at Le Mans. weather continues to warm up throughout the day. We expect the Fords to get better and better and better, and that is not good news for the Ferrari camp. This is right in my wheelhouse. This is where I live, right here, going to chase somebody down and pass them. That point of the race, you know, you're starting to wind down. When you pass somebody for the lead, that could be the pass. If you have a car that can go run somebody down, pass them, and keep going, they're gonna have to catch you, right? There's not gonna be any freebies. The Ford Accelerate seems to about the same level, but eventually the Ferrari gets to a plateau and the Ford just seems to keep pulling. Ah, oh, it's working. Ryan Briscoe 
board the 69. So in the top three right now in GTE Pro, there's Ford, Ferrari, and Ford. And these are the two US-based cars from Ford Chip Ganassi in the top three. Problems for the 82, Tony Vlander. That is a big spin. This is what's scary right now. Hopefully people are paying attention to the yellows and Vlander trying to get out of the way and then back on track. This is also huge for Ford. You can't give away anything to competitors like this that you're running up against or Ford will say thank you very much and take that and capitalize on it big time. Now that the uh, Ferraris made that little spin and given us a little breather, I think the race has switched a little bit. Now it's going to be a pure reliability match and uh, the pace seems to be very evenly matched. So fingers crossed and bring it home right now. Uh, just kind of sit tight, let the guys figure it out. Now there's nothing I can do anymore. Just watch and, and hope. Before Vlander spun, it was, it was just over five seconds. It's now two minutes and five seconds that that cost them. Huge. And what it does is it moves Tony Vlander back closer to Ryan Briscoe in the 69. So it's like one moment you're trying to hang on to the lead, the next moment you're trying to recover from the mistake and hang on to second place. Joey, this is last. Just an extra break, too. Remember, Dirk is getting in the car. Copy, business lap. Two hours to go. To this point, Ford has been nearly flawless. Dirk Mueller going in. Joey helping him out. Mueller should be in now until the checker. Two hours left. Joey gives him a pat and says, have a good one, brother. And meanwhile, the 82 in second, not about to give up the fight. You're plus 36 seconds right now. Two hours to go, Dirk. Two hours to go. Focus forward. Keep the car clean. I tried to go slow, to be honest, but I was making little mistakes. I just told myself, just do your normal pace. I mean, if the car is not able to do um, 10 more laps, um, I mean, then, then it's it. I had to be focused. Plus 43 seconds, 4-3. Doing a good job. Almost halfway through this step. Let's go to Andrew Marriott. Well, Raj, I, uh, I can't say you've got a smile on your face, because I'm sure your, your heart's in your mouth at the moment. Yeah, we've got uh, 37 minutes to go, and maybe I'll smile then. Keep everything crossed, Raj. Yeah, I've got all my fingers and toes crossed. <laughs> Thank you. He sounded nervous, didn't he? <laughs> yeah, he did. 2003, we had about a two-lap lead. I came in for the last pit stop, and the center lock nut that holds the wheel on, it rolled underneath the car, sharp side up. It's hard to tell a story because that's how I lost the race, but the sharp edge punctured right through the carbon fiber bottle of the car into the oil pan, and all the oil came out of the car. What it takes to get to Le Mans and to be in a winning car, in a winning position, and have it taken away from you, and know 
that will never happen. I will never win Lamar. That was a tough pill because I knew this was ours. Four minutes to go, Dirk. Your gap is one minute, 19 seconds. The guys might you put on tires. They're a little quicker, but we have plenty of gap. When I was really little, probably about four or five, but I remember my father coming home and uh, he was so excited to tell me about it uh, and what a great win it had been for Ford. And I remember thinking, you know, I wish I had been there. this weekend I mean that's something you will never ever dream about I mean um, it's crazy I think we have achieved something big here today <laughs> this is as good as it gets when we approved this program we did it to come race here at Le Mans and uh, I think we, we proved it was the right decision we did what we came here to do. We did it for our employees and our families and everybody who loves sport. Um, I hope they're proud of us. Sebastian Bourdais. Sebastian's dad, Patrick, drove in this race. When you race for so many people and you feel that there's kind of a greatness in the whole thing, it, it's, it's just something I've never experienced before. And to be able to see how much it meant to Ford's family, it was just priceless. You know, I think back 50 years to my father, who I was there with, and I think he would be extremely proud. And he would have been even prouder the minute we passed that Ferrari. What a moment. I mean, you know, I had to sort of take a hold of myself. That was really incredible. Holy cow, we won Le Mans, you know? You dream about this stuff, and you try and picture yourself in the moment, you know? And it's crazy to think about the amount of people it took to get here. I don't know how to feel yet, but I, I know it feels good. It was about coming back to Le Mans and showing that we as Ford Motor Company had what it takes to win. It took all of us to make this happen. Every one of those people in every one of those garages put the Ford GT across the finish line. That I do know. This is what it means to be a team.